In the heart of Eos, a quaint village perched atop a hill, a tale of music, love and adventure began to unfold. Patrick, a nomadic medical student at heart, shared his temporary abode, Papa Antonia's hostel, with several backpackers from Sweden and Denmark. United by their shared passion for music, they formed a band their notes echoing off the walls of a small beach near Scorpion's Disco. Among these travelers was Trina, a vibrant spirit hailing from Skanderborg in Denmark. Their connection was instantaneous and profound, leading them to Athens in search of work. The allure of the islands, however, proved too strong, their freedom too intoxicating. Disenchantment soon set in, and they decided to trade the dusty streets of Athens for the enticing allure of Santorini, guided by the advice of some American tourists. As the ferry cut through the darkening waters of the Aegean, their excitement was palpable. They arrived on the volcanic isle at dawn, greeted by the cries of seagulls and the scent of myrtle and eucalyptus wafting in the air. Ascending the 587 cobbled steps up the face of the Red Hill, past whitewashed houses and gossiping elders, they found refuge in a small hostel on a winding back road in Firostefani. Their days were filled with adventure, afternoons spent on a quiet black pebble beach shaded by tamarisk trees, evenings spent watching the sun paint the sky in hues of orange, red, violet, mauve and pink in Oya. Amid these moments Patrick found himself falling in love with Trini. Their spirits, alike and free, were drawn to each other, creating a bond that was both profound and delicate. One evening, as the last church bell echoed through the air and the sun set the sea ablaze, Patrick held Trine close. The words he wanted to convey hung heavily in the silence between them. He yearned to express his love, his desire to shield her from the world's harsh realities, and that he would soon have to return to his studies in Dublin. But the weight of his aspirations held him back. Instead, he suggested a visit to a local courtyard restaurant, a sanctuary known only to the Greeks. In that moment, something shifted. Trina's gaze softened, a silent acknowledgement of the journey Patrick was on, a journey that did not include her. Their laughter echoed through the night as they set off in search of the courtyard restaurant, but the bond that had grown between them had been subtly altered. Their journey led them to Akrotiri, a remote village in Santorini, where their story continued to unfold. From forming a band to exploring Santorini, Patrick, the author of The Needle and the Damage Done Journey, was one of self-discovery and love. It was a journey marked by the allure of freedom, the bond with Trini, and the subtle changes in their relationship. The story serves as a testament to the power of experiences and the indelible marks they leave on our lives. Patrick and Trina reached the quiet village of Akrotiri, hidden away in the southern reaches of Santorini. Looking for a suitable restaurant, they enter a quaint courtyard with green creepers climb flaking whitewashed walls. There are some farm animals amble near the entrance and the locals within curiously observe the newcomers. The aroma of Magiritsa soup, a traditional Greek delicacy, fills the night air, enticing and inviting. An elderly woman, seemingly the proprietor, weaves through the crowd. Yet despite polite smiles and nods, she leaves the couple standing at the entrance, seemingly reluctant to offer them a table. Eventually, they decide to sit themselves by a long wooden table under a pomegranate tree. The only sound comes from a squeaking metal fan with three and a half blades. Meanwhile, the other diners look at them and begin to giggle and whisper amongst themselves. After a while, Patrick asks for a bottle of Retsina, a popular Greek wine. When none is served, he strikes the wooden table in defiance. The noise of his fist echoes through the courtyard and brings an immediate hush, a collective gasp of anticipation from the others in the courtyard for what might unfold next. An old man then rises from his chair and speaks quietly to the old woman. There's a warmth in his eyes, a gentle persuasion, in contrast to the black clothes of mourning that the old woman wears. The old woman smiles, cackles something to herself and then returns from the kitchen with a bottle of Retsina and a large platter of food. A young girl follows suit, bringing the couple some water and glasses. The atmosphere lightens, the tension eases, and conversation in the courtyard flows again. As the feast begins, the courtyard fills with laughter and stories. 
The young girl returns with a small candle, its flickering flame casting a golden glow that softens the edges of the night. The old gentleman who had helped earlier asked Patrick if he comes from Australia, sparking a new thread of conversation. It seems his son is now living down in Melbourne. Patrick assures him that he is a medical student from Ireland and that he would like to visit Australia one day. The night grows older, the plates empty, and the candle burns lower. After much protest to the old woman, another bottle of Retsina eventually arrives at Patrick and Trin's table, and the courtyard hums with the quiet chatter of contentment. The hour grows late, and after much protest about getting more wine, it's time for Patrick to settle the bill with traveler's checks. The old woman takes the check and studies it under the light of the Aegean moon, eventually passing it around the nearby table for each person to read aloud the name and value. Then, a surprising revelation cuts through the night. The old man gives it to a family member who speaks good English. The younger man starts laughing loudly, looking directly at the newcomers with a broad smile. Mr. Patrick Treacy, he says, this place is not a restaurant. You have been eating and drinking with my family in our private house.